I never imagined ending up like this for a business social. Hey, you've been looking grim, James. Hey, you, help him loosen up a bit. Seems like James is interested in you. The drunk CEO called over a VIP hostess who was attending to a colleague next to us. It was because I had been intently watching that hostess. As instructed, the VIP hostess sat down next to me, reached out towards me, and started to touch me. She moved her gel polished fingertips slowly. Just being touched by her feminine, gentle hands made my body tense. I was looking at her beautiful face, feeling extremely nervous. My name is James Taylor. I'm a 31-year-old divorced man working in hospital administration. I divorced my wife, Jane, three years ago. Jane was a truly wonderful woman, and I still sincerely appreciate that I met her. So why did we divorce? The blunt truth is, being with me was nothing but a negative for Jane. James, I'm home. I'm making dinner now. Jane would say that and rush into the kitchen. However, she was surprised to see that I had already prepared stew. It's okay, I've already prepared dinner. You must be tired from working late, right? Let's have dinner together. I thought she'd be happy, but to my surprise, Jane had a gloomy look on her face. Stu was supposed to be one of her favorite dishes, so I wondered what was wrong. Ah, uh, James, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for what? I didn't understand why Jane was apologizing. But then, she said something unexpected. I'm the worst. Having my husband make dinner, from now on, I'll prepare something in advance when I'll be late from work. You don't have to do that. No, it's my policy to balance both work and housework. Jane said that and continued to blame herself throughout dinner. For me, it was not a bother at all to cook for Jane. I was excited and looked forward to her return home, hoping she'd enjoy the meal. I thought that in this day and age, housework shouldn't just be a woman's responsibility, but should be a shared task between spouses. But apparently Jane didn't see it that way. Jane and I are the same age. After graduating from a prestigious private university, she started working at a major bank. She's a competent woman. We met at a social gathering, and I immediately fell for Jane, who is serious and intellectual. It seems Jane also had a good impression of me, and after six months of dating, we got married when we were 27. I admire Jane not only for her kindness, but also as a person. However, within the first year of our marriage, I started to feel like I wasn't being a good husband for her. I usually got home from work on time, but Jane was always swamped with work and had to do overtime every day. She's a competent employee, and the company has high expectations for her as a future leader. I supported her and wished she would let me handle the household chores so she could focus on her work. But as I mentioned, Jane was a perfectionist and didn't seem to want me to do the housework. I can't let my husband do the housework, she would say every time I offered to help. But it was clear that her work was getting more demanding. Despite her dedication to balance work and household chores, she was visibly wearing herself out day by day. She must have been extremely tired. She has become less talkative and more hysterical on more occasions. Just the other day, when I suggested getting takeout since she didn't want me to cook, the conversation took a turbo turn. So you're saying the food I make isn't good enough? No, that's not what I mean. I tried to calm her down, but she didn't speak to me for the rest of the day. I know Jane didn't act that way because she wanted to fight with me. She was simply at her limit. Not wanting to push my beloved wife any further, I proposed a divorce to Jane. I see. Divorce, huh? Jane quietly accepted my proposal. Of course, since I was the one who suggested the divorce, I intended to pay alimony. But Jane declined. Even though the amount might not mean much to her as she was working for a big corporation, 
it was a matter of my feelings. I explained this to her, but she still refused. It's fine. I understand that I wasn't a good wife. No one would love someone like me. Unlike the hysterical Jane I had known recently, she looked genuinely sad at that moment. Still in love with Jane, I yearned to hold her tightly in my arms. The wish will never come true since we've decided to divorce. There must be plenty of men more suitable for Jane than I am. So, we got divorced and began separate lives. After divorcing Jane, my co-worker and friend, Mark, suggested I should seek new relationships. You're still young. Let's look for a new romance. I'll set up a mixer for you. I appreciated Mark's sentiment, but I wasn't quite ready to meet someone. Apparently, I loved Jane more deeply than I thought. It also seemed somewhat inappropriate to look for another woman so soon after divorcing Jane. I felt guilty, wondering whether I, who had caused Jane sadness, had the right to find happiness. Now that I was divorced, with more time to spare, I began to devote myself to work more than ever. Thanks to that, I was given more responsibility at work. Lately, I've been personally noticed by the director of the hospital, which I'm grateful for. Before I knew it, three years had passed since I divorced Jane. However, I hadn't been involved with any women since then, and there wasn't a single day I forgot about Jane. Even though our relationship was supposed to be over, she would likely continue to live in my heart. Living a life of going back and forth between work and home, one day, the CEO suggested we all go for drinks at a club in downtown LA. I'd like to deepen our friendship with you guys, who have been managing the hospital administration so appropriately. Of course, it's all on me. To be honest, I wasn't very interested in this proposal. I'd never visited such a place before and wasn't interested in women right now. Even if I were to be entertained in this state, I didn't think I would enjoy it. But I suppose it's time to grow up. Since the CEO had made the suggestion, it wouldn't be right for only me to be absent. Thus I, along with other members of the group, visited a high-class club in downtown LA. This club has a nice atmosphere, and there are only wonderful women here. I'm sure everyone will be satisfied. The CEO said that and enthusiastically led the way into the club. Indeed, as the CEO said, it was a beautiful club with a good atmosphere. I, who had a flashy and flamboyant impression, felt relieved when I saw the calm ambience of the club and thought I might be able to drink peacefully here. The hostess, Catherine, who led our group to our seats, was also a wonderful, classy person. We've been waiting for you, everyone. The young hostess, who is called Mia, greeted us warmly. It's a pleasure to have you here, gentlemen. Let me show you to your table. Please enjoy yourselves. A woman who seemed to be the manager, called Catherine, stepped back as a young hostess, seemingly a favorite of the boss, led us to our table. Each of us had a hostess to attend to us, but I was utterly astonished by one of them. What a surprise, standing before me in a dress was my ex-wife, Jane. Jane, why is she here? Jane, now dressed in a vibrant dress and heavily made up, looked nothing like the woman I remembered. But there was no doubt about it, it was Jane. There was no way I could mistake the face of my wife whom I loved so much. Jane too noticed my presence and her eyes, adorned with eyeshadow, widened. For a moment, it felt as if time had stopped between us, but of course, no one around us noticed. The girls distributed themselves evenly among the tables and began serving us. Jane didn't come to my side, but instead sat next to a colleague of mine, Carl. Carl, faced with Jane, began chattering excitedly. Getting to be entertained by such a beauty, what's your name? It's Janet. If she introduced herself as Janet, then it must indeed be Jane. 
With this strong belief, I stole glances at Jane while chatting with the other hostesses. I couldn't help but wonder why Jane, who had once worked for a large corporation, was now working at a club as a hostess in downtown LA. Jane had always been quite a beauty, but she now looked even more refined. Her makeup was flawless and her dress fit her perfectly. Could this air of elegance indicate that she had been working as a hostess for quite a while? All sorts of thoughts were racing through my head, but I couldn't get drunk despite drinking alcohol. In contrast, the CEO, completely wasted, blurted out something unthinkable. You seem a bit uptight, James. Hey, you, why don't you help him relax? It seems like James is interested in you. The intoxicated boss called over Jane, who was serving Carl. It was because I had been gazing at Jane. As if being ordered, Jane sat next to me, stretched out her hand towards me, and started to touch me. She moved her fingers, beautifully painted with gel nails, slowly. Being touched by such feminine, graceful hands, my body stiffened. She, too, had a bitter look on her face. Jane must never have imagined running into her ex-husband in a place like this. As she touched my thigh over my suit, I, filled with intense nervousness, looked into the face of Janet, or rather, Jane. A close, I couldn't help but be taken aback by her sultriness and beauty, accentuated by her vibrant makeup. But at the same time, I was getting a somewhat tired impression from Jane. Of course, hospitality work can be a tough job, and fatigue would inevitably accumulate. Yet, beyond that, I felt a shade of worry in her, as if she was troubled by life itself. Janet has got your heart racing, hasn't she, James? With no way of knowing what was going on in my heart, the onlookers, including the boss, were laughing amusingly. In the midst of all this, only Jane and I, each with our own thoughts kept hidden, wrapped up the night at the club. Why was Jane working as a hostess? I may be overstepping, but I want to know. Thus thinking, I sent Jane an email for the first time in three years. The email seemed to have arrived, but there was no reply even after a week. Perhaps being contacted by me may have been annoying to Jane. But something stuck in my mind, so I decided to visit Jane's family home directly. According to a mutual acquaintance, Jane is currently living at her family home. I quickly decided to take some cookies and visit Jane's family home on my next day off. Actually, this is my second time visiting Jane's family home. Jane's parents were self-employed, affluent and refined people. But they seemed to have a policy of not getting too involved with their daughter, so my introduction to her parent was casual. I thought they would ask me more about myself, so I was somewhat taken aback when they calmly approved our marriage. Jane had said this about it. My parents are obsessed with my sister Alice, and they don't care about me. Jane has an older sister named Alice. While Jane was a refined beauty, Alice was a glamorous beauty with modeling experience. Still, to my eyes, Jane was the more attractive of the two. Alice had led a splendid life and was married to a man who ran an accounting firm. She is a woman who belonged to what you might call the winning team. From Jane's parents' point of view, they may have gone through many twists and turns when raising Alice, as she is the eldest daughter. But when it came to their second daughter, Jane, I assumed they realized there was no need to interfere so much in her upbringing and approached it with a detached attitude. However, when I visited Jane's family home, I was confronted with a shocking reality. What the, why is it so run down? After a long time, I was astonished to see Jane's family home. The building itself was large and grand, but the garden was completely overgrown. Even though a gardener used to visit regularly and the garden was always kept neat, now the weeds were growing wild and there was even bulky trash left outside. Feeling uncomfortable, 
I stepped onto the property of the house and heard a loud yelling voice. You useless person, I want a soda, go get it for me now. When I went toward the voice, I found an obese woman with a shaggy head yelling at Jane in front of the entrance. Who is this person? I wondered for a moment before recognizing her as Alice. Seeing the drastically changed appearance of Alice, who was once so beautiful, I was at a loss for words. What on earth happened to her? I was sneaking around in the shadows to check on the two of them. Okay, I'll go. After being yelled at by Alice, Jane responded in a faint voice. There were deep dark circles under Jane's eyes, and though I hadn't noticed it when she was wearing a long dress at the club, her shorts revealed a large bruise on her leg. In a split second, I began to suspect that Jane might be experiencing regular harassment from Alice. You're enjoying making me suffer, aren't you? Like in our college days, you're sabotaging my happiness, aren't you? Uh, becoming emotional, Alice tried to forcefully grab Jane's shoulder. Jane was trembling in fear, her body shrinking away. Unable to bear the sight any longer, I called out, Jane, and grabbed her hand. Then we both took off running. A stunned Alice shrieked hysterically, where are you going? But I paid her no mind. I assured Jane into my car and drove off. While in a daze, Jane finally spoke up. Why are you here? I saw you at the club the other day and I've been worried about you. You look pale now and that bruise. Can you tell me what happened? It has nothing to do with you, since we're divorced, right? Please, take me home. If I don't get back soon, my sisters will scold me. Jane said so, and repeatedly begged me to drive back to her parents' house. Why would she want to go back there? I told Jane, I can't let you go back to that house. She clearly needed rest in a calm environment. I decided to take Jane to the hospital. She seemed very tired, so the doctor decided to administer an Fordrip and have her admitted to the hospital for a month. I felt immense gratitude towards the understanding doctor. Although Jane initially resisted strongly, she soon fell into a deep sleep on the hospital bed, likely due to extreme fatigue. During this time, Alice kept calling Jane's phone over and over. I listened to the voicemails Alice left. They were nothing more than threats. Jane, where on earth are you? If you don't come home, you won't get away with it. While frightened by Alice's hysteria, I waited for Jane to recover. The hospital also judged that Jane needed mental care, so she started receiving psychiatric treatment while regaining her physical strength. Many more injuries were found on Jane's body, revealing that she had been suffering regular abuse. Once Jane was finally well enough for a face-to-face -face conversation, I decided to talk to her in the hospital room. She had lost over 10 pounds since I saw her at the club and her complexion was Poe. I've caused you trouble, haven't I? I never thought my body was screaming for help to the point where I had to undergo such extensive treatment. You've really been pushing yourself too hard. Can you tell me exactly what happened? Okay, actually. With that, Jane began to explain everything that had transpired. After our divorce, Jane discovered that the family business her parents ran had fallen on hard times when she returned home. Her sister, Alice, had also returned home after her divorce, the result of an affair Alice had. From my point of view, Alice had it coming, but the shock of her divorce led her to overeat, and she has fallen into her current hysterical state. Despite the already strained household finances, Alice had been recklessly spending money to relieve her stress. To help her struggling family, Jane had taken up a second job as a hostess in downtown LA. She was commanded by her parents to bring in some income to help the family through their financial crisis. Jane did her best to protect her family, but eventually, the bank discovered her side job as a hostess and she was fired. She is now taking care of Alice and doing all the housework during the day, while working as a hostess at night. I couldn't believe all of this happened without my knowledge. 
Regardless of the circumstances, the burden on Jane was far too great. Why do you have to go so far? I have no choice. I've caused a lot of trouble for my parents and my sister. According to Jane, her parents had always favored Alice. Wanting her parents' attention, Jane devoted herself to studying. However, she failed to get into her first choice public university and ended up attending a private university. Jane's mother, Michelle, had constantly told her, we paid a lot of money for you to attend private university, be grateful. Also, there was a dispute between Jane and Alice when Jane was a college student. At the time, Alice had a boyfriend. Midway through their relationship, Alice's boyfriend grew tired of her self-centered behavior and, unbelievably, began to fall for Jane. When Alice found it out, she was so shocked that she overdosed on pills and was rushed to the hospital. Their parents, devastated, rushed to the hospital and constantly blamed Jane. Poor Alice, it's all because of you, Jane. You seduced him and caused this. Jane's father, Thomas, even said, it would have been better if you were the one being rushed to the hospital, not Alice. Whether it was a flashback to that time or not, Jane continued speaking, tears streaming down her face. I've caused trouble for my parents and deeply hurt my sister. That's why I must serve my family, and without that, I have no value. That's not true. I grabbed Jane's shoulders and looked straight into her eyes. Her eyes, filled with tears, met mine. Even when we were married, we never had such a profound eye contact. Jane, you don't need to associate with anyone who doesn't value you, even if they're your blood relatives. Besides, I love you from the bottom of my heart, no matter what. So never say you have no value. James, when Jane called my name, she wrapped her arms around my back. Even without further words, we felt a deep understanding of each of her's feelings. I knew then I would never let go of Jane. It was a moment of profound realization. Later on, Jane's parents repeatedly demanded me to give Jane back. So, I went directly to Jane's house and played them a recording. I have recorded everything clearly, including what happened that day with Alice. If you try to interfere with Jane again, I will also step up. I warned them. After I said that, the three of them looked as if they had bitten into a sour lemon. What, then, who's gonna take care of me? Alice wailed as she said that, but surprisingly, we were able to cleanly and easily sever ties with her toxic parents. Jane's former home was in dire straits, unable to make ends meet and considering bankruptcy. It's pitiful indeed, having to take care of Alice in such a situation. After cutting ties with her family and a year later, Jane and I got married again. Jane got a job in the administration department of a company. She was a former banker and an excellent one at that, so she often had to work overtime due to her colleagues relying on her. I'll be late today. Could you prepare something for dinner? Sure, I'll cook whatever you want. Really? Then, I want a gratin. All right, leave it to me, I said, making fists pump. True love is not about wanting something from the other person. It's about wanting to do something for them. I want to do something for her. This thoughtfulness is love. I can proudly say that meeting such a person makes me the lickiest man in the world. My name is Ken Jones. I'm a 50-year-old nurse working in a hospital. And right now, I'm on the verge of making a major life decision. In front of me, there is a piece of green paper with my name and signature already filled in. In other words, I was staring at a divorce paper, heaving a sigh. I have a wife, Mary, who's three years younger than me. We got married five years ago. I tied the knot at 45. We met at work, where Mary worked as a medical assistant. Both of us had been so absorbed in our work that we hadn't had the chance to meet someone and had given up on the idea of marriage. 
That's why we hit it official, and before we knew it, we were dating. Because we were no longer young, we took extra care before deciding to marry. After a few years of dating, we finally tied the knot. So, it was quite a late marriage at 45 and 42. Considering our age, we gave up on having children, but instead, we vowed to spend the rest of our lives together. However, it turns out we were naive to think that way. After all, both Mary and I had lived our lives dedicated to our work. At first, we tried to align our shifts and cherish the time we could spend together, but inevitably, our schedules clashed due to night shifts. And then, Mary started having health issues. It was menopause, and it was quite troublesome. According to Mary, she was always irritable for no particular reason. She was tired, she was in a bad mood, she was always grumbled. Being a man, I couldn't understand her struggles. But what I did understand was that Mary was suffering. But there was nothing we could do. Our days were filled with petty quarrels. Both Mary and I were tired of our married life. In the span of five years, our love had completely cooled off. I began to wonder if there was any meaning to our being together. Every day, we screamed at each other, cursed at each other. Could we live like this forever? The answer was clear without even thinking. I'm home. While I was looking at the divorce paper in the living room, I heard an indifferent greeting. Mary had returned from work. I hid the divorce paper under the table and waited for Mary to come to the living room. After a while, Mary came back seems grumpy. At least reply if you're here. Hi. Cold words, a cold greeting. There was no warmth left between us. Listen. What? What do you think about getting a divorce? In my words, Mary froze. When I looked at her face, she didn't look surprised. I see, I understood. As usual, Mary replied coldly. She didn't seem sad, nor surprised. Even though I was the one who brought it up, I was slightly irritated that she didn't react at all. But, I knew I didn't have the right to express that. So, without saying a word, I handed over the divorce papers and Mary didn't say anything, just swiftly signed them. Tomorrow, I'll bring it to the city hall. This would be the end of our five years of married life. I'll make dinner for the last. Mary said, starting cook for dinner. Even after signing, Mary hadn't changed at all. She ate dinner as usual and went to bed early. It was a bit eerie that nothing had changed. But there was indeed a change. I realized the change just before bedtime. The bedroom was the same, but we were in separate beds. Even sleeping in the same room was something we hadn't done in a while. It's been a while since we've slept together. Mary started a conversation with me while I was having trouble sleeping. That's true. We initially shared the same bed, didn't we? You tossed and turned so much in your sleep, it was impossible to sleep next to you. That's why we ended up in separate beds soon after. We had a genuine conversation after a long time and got carried away reminiscing about the old days, so we spent some time chatting. But Mary, I remember you used to sneak into my bed saying it was cold. That did happen, didn't it? I knew you were intentionally wearing skimpy pajamas. Oh, so you knew. We are no longer young, so there was no visible flirting. But Mary used to try to attract my attention often when we first got married. I found that endearing and used to give her attention. Recalling such things, I glanced at Mary. Upon closer inspection, Mary was wearing skimpy pajamas. Did you remember? Mary noticed that I was looking at her pajamas, smiled a little. May I get into the bed because it's cold? I hesitated for a moment, but invited her into the bed. We're old enough now and wouldn't get excited. 
Since we'll be complete strangers from tomorrow, let's just make this a final memory. Mary, lying next to me with her shoulder touching mine. In the course of five years, she seemed to have lost quite a lot of weight. She had been busy with work, and at this age, it's easy to get tired. I realized I must have been pushing her too hard. That's not to say I want to go back to being married, but I don't want Mary to be unhappy. Thinking about such things. Good night. Good night. We fell asleep. And the next day, by the time I woke up, Mary was gone. All of Mary's belongings were gone, and there was no trace of her having been in the room. However, in the living room, there was a note left behind that said, Thank you for everything. Please take care of yourself. That's what was written. Half a year later, I had changed jobs and was working at a large hospital. The marriage was a result of an office romance, and I felt uncomfortable after the divorce. Plus, I wanted a job that paid well. Those were the main reasons. Although I'm single now, I'm still a workaholic, so I guess I'm good with not getting married for a while. At least, I'm done with office romances. Mr. Jones, the new patient came in a while ago. My boss called out to me, and I looked through the documents. I recall, it was a patient who had a spread of cancer. She had been receiving outpatient treatment at another hospital, but from now on, they would be admitted and start chemotherapy. Surprisingly, her name is the same as Mary. Moreover, her last name is the same as Mary's maiden name. Feeling some kind of connection, I headed over to greet her while taking her temperature. Excuse me, it's time for your temperature check. When I entered the private room, the patient, who had been looking out the window, turned to face me. Ah, yes, go ahead, huh? Could it be? Her face was pale, her cheeks were sunken, and she was extremely thin. But there was no mistake that it was Mary, the woman I had been married to. Even though I changed hospitals, you changed workplaces. In a faint but unmistakable voice, I heard Mary's familiar voice. Mary was also incredibly surprised to see me. But I was beyond surprised. Because the document stated the spread of her cancer. It wasn't just that she had lost a little weight or seemed low on energy. Looking at the completely changed Mary, it was clear that her condition was not good. Moreover, the date when the cancer was discovered was also written in her medical chart. Mary's cancer was discovered just before we divorced. So, on the day I brought up divorce, Mary must have known she had cancer. Why didn't you tell me? Oh, about the cancer? Yeah, I guess it's out now, so I should tell you. Even though I had no right to hear about it anymore, the words slipped out of my mouth. Mommy guessed my feelings and told me many things. That even without the cancer, our marriage had already cooled down. That she thought she was the cause. And knowing that she didn't have long left, she couldn't hold me back and agreed to the divorce. Listening to all this, I deeply regretted. Why didn't we discuss things more thoroughly? Why didn't I notice Mary's changes? I thought she had lost a little weight, but why did I leave it at that? Despite suffering from illness, I pushed Mary away like adding insult to injury. I had done something terrible. As I blamed myself and sank into despair. Come on, you are healthier than me. Why hang your head more than I am? I was scolded by Mary. I had always dwelled when I made mistakes, and Mary often had to snap me out of it. That's right, I was supported by Mary. Despite that, I still haven't repaid her kindness. The person who supported me for five years is now right in front of me. I look straight at Mary. Look, I know I don't have the right to say this anymore, but I want to take care of you until the end. When I bowed my head to Mary, 
She smacked my head. What are you talking about? You have work. In between work and after I'm done. Seeing my aunt persistence, Mary finally gave in, saying, Do as you like, with a look of both exasperation and joy. From then, I took care of Mary. Of course, Mary's parents visited her often, but I took care of everything else. I thought Mary's parents wouldn't accept me, but they did. Mary's family home is far away, which made it difficult for them to visit frequently. Honestly, there was no one else but me to take care of Mary's needs. For the following months, I visited Mary's hospital room every day. Whether I was at work, after work, on my days off, or before my night shifts, I was always by Mary's side. Then began Mary's treatment with chemotherapy. In the past, I've been cared for many patients as a nurse, but when it's family, it's a different story. Treating a stranger and treating family are entirely different. I intended to support her treatment as a professional, but I inevitably became emotionally involved. I was desperate. Mary had started treatment immediately after our divorce, but it didn't seem to be effective. The cancer had metastasized. Cancer treatment is incredibly difficult and painful. She had endured all that, alone. I should have been there to support her. I wish I could do something for her. Despite all this, Mary remained positive and fought bravely against her illness. Even when she was feeling miserable, she managed to smile for me. That smile made me aware of my own helplessness. I couldn't do anything for her. Then, as if to add insult to injury, Mary's treatment had to be halted. With Mary's weakened body, there were few treatment options left. We had no choice but to abandon aggressive treatment. Mary accepted this reality, saying, I'll live my remaining time to the fullest. She whispered this quietly. So, I did my best to support her. We laughed at funny stories together, went for walks when she was able to go outside. We watched movies on rainy days, started knitting together, and made little crafts, albeit clumsily. Mary laughed at my awkward handiwork. These little things brought us so much happiness. Mary seemed to feel the same way, living each day peacefully. But the cancer continued to torment her. These happy times couldn't last long. From this point, Mary's condition began to deteriorate rapidly. She had sleepless nights due to intense pain. She cried more often, trying to hide it from me. We managed to get through with painkillers, but she gradually lost her vitality and laughed less frequently. All I could do was offer encouragement, but it seemed that Mary appreciated that. Thank you for always being there, she told me. If I was alone, it would have been much harder. I thought I was ready to give up, but you being here every day gives me the will to live another day. Eventually, Mary was no longer able to get up. She seemed lonely as she spoke to me. Despite her immobile body, she told me that she was able to face another day because of me. And yet, Mary was dying alone. Because Mary and I were strangers. I was the one who wanted it that way, but now I deeply regret it. I tried to express my rekindled affection for Bedrid and Mary in words. Hey, what's up? Will you marry me? I finally sent my second proposal in a silent hospital room, devoid of any mood. Mary widened her eyes in surprise, then smiled slightly. You're silly. I won't get married again. Plus, you're a divorcee, right? It'd be a scandal if your wife passed away after remarrying. Despite her words, Mary looked delighted. And I was rejected quite spectacularly. But I just couldn't give up, so I handed Mary a marriage certificate. Of course, I had already signed it. You're such a fool. Mary accepted it with joy. She embraced it like a treasure. Maybe that was enough to satisfy her. A few days later, 
she passed away. She lived a month longer than her terminal diagnosis predicted. She really put up a good fight. That's why I wish for her to be happy in heaven. After Mary's death, preparations for the funeral were quickly underway. As we were not legally married, I couldn't be the chief mourner. Despite this, Mary's parents told me they wanted me to sit in the family section. I was initially going to decline, but they were insistent, and in the end, I took a seat with the family. The funeral proceeded, and we headed to the grave. Strangely, I didn't shed a tear. I had already steeled myself while caring for Mary. While waiting for the preparations at the grave, I sat on a bench, aimlessly looking at the sky. Mary was no longer in this world. It felt like a gaping hole had opened in my heart. Ken, you were here. My Mel said as she noticed me staring blankly at the sky. Her swollen eyes revealed she had been crying. Her sorrow must be greater than mine, having lost her daughter. Mary, she left a letter for me to give to you. She wanted it to be given on the day of her funeral. What? What was handed to me was a letter and a diary from Mary. I opened the diary first. It was a simple diary, just as Mary would have it, with only a sentence or two about trivial things. But around the time we met, the sentence became longer. It documented our dates, evaluations of my work, and conversations and our domestic misstep after we moved in together, all carefully detailed. Ken ate the omelet I made today, despite it not tasting good. He didn't show any distaste. He didn't lie. He just ate silently. I felt his kindness for not saying it wasn't tasty. But these words gradually turned into reflections about herself. It started around the time she hit menopause. I took out my frustration on Ken again. I can't forgive myself for doing this. I just shout never able to have a proper discussion. Ken is growing colder. If I were in his position, I would feel the same, but it still makes me sad. The last pages of Mary's diary were filled with regret, day after day. I found myself glued to a particular date in the diary. Today, I found out I have cancer. It seems like I don't have much time left. I'm sure if I tell Ken, he'll be kinder but I don't want to do something that cowardly. Even if I die, I don't want him to grieve, so please forgive me for being harsh with him. At those words, I catch my breath. It was dated a month before we divorced. In other words, for a whole month, Mary intentionally acted tough towards me. She was trying to distance my feelings from her. With trembling hands, I searched for the date when I suggested a divorce Today, Ken proposed a divorce. Finally, I can set him free. But when I dressed lightly like old times, he noticed. I was so happy. Thank you for a final memory left. Her diary entries stopped there. I had no idea that she was thinking so much about me. With tears welling up in my eyes, I opened the letter. I never expected to see you again at the new hospital. Even if I were to die, I didn't want you to cry. But when you said you wanted to take care of me, I was so happy. I'm sorry I couldn't say no. I almost cried when you proposed again. I have no regrets now. I will go to heaven first, but don't you come until you're an old man. And if we meet again in heaven, and if your feelings haven't changed, then please marry me. Until then, I'll keep our marriage certificate. From Mary. By the time I finished reading, I was crying uncontrollably. Mary's feelings were overflowing in this letter. That's why her parents allowed me to sit in the family section. For a while, I cried like a child. I cried pathetically, my eyes swollen. But at the grave, just as Mary wished, I did not cry. She said she wanted me not to cry. So, I decided to bid her farewell with a smile. Mary, who slept peacefully in the casket, held our marriage certificate in her hand, and her face was incredibly calm. 
The marriage certificate with my signature and seal had Mary's signature duly filled in. My name is David Richardson. I'm a 23-year-old government administrator. Two years ago, I got my administrative qualification and left the company I've been working at to join the current office where I'm employed. I'm getting used to the work, and I'm generally enjoying life. But to be honest, I do have one concern. Oh, brother, not again. Why is this place such a mess? My sister, Emily, visits my apartment and she always starts with this comment, throwing her brows and sighing deeply. Come on, I can't help it. I'm busy with work. Listen, David, I'm telling you this because I'm worried. Living in such an insanitary place, eating junk food all day, it's just too unhealthy. Indeed, I haven't paid attention to what I ate recently, and I've been feeling stressed living in this mess. Emily, always the responsible one, comes to my apartment almost every week, but I mess it up faster than she can clean. You're right. You're absolutely right, Emily. David, you're doing well financially now, so why not consider a housekeeping service? A housekeeping service? Yes. You pay them, and a housekeeper comes to your house and does all sorts of chores, including cleaning. Even if they can't come every day, having them two or three times a week would make a huge difference, I think. I hadn't even considered such a service before. But I'm not good at housework, so it's a perfect fit for me. Emily, thank you. I'll try a housekeeping service right away. That's a good idea. You can't even get a girlfriend with this mess, you know. At Emily's words, I blushed in embarrassment. I've never had a girlfriend in my 23 years of life. Struck by her accurate guess, I blurted out a response, flustered. Well, that's none of your business. Okay, okay. And with a small chuckle, Emily left the apartment spotless and went home. Despite everything, I'm truly grateful to Emily. I actually have a bitter memory related to romance. That's partly why I've been hesitant to get involved in romantic relationships. During my senior year of high school, there was a girl I liked. Her name was Claire, a beautiful, kind, and intelligent classmate. Hey David, shall we study together at the library again today? Sounds great. Let's do it. So. We spent almost every day studying together at the private library. Back then, I was aiming for a scholarship program at college, so I devoted myself to studying. Claire, do you know how to solve this problem? Oh, sure. You should apply this formula here. When Claire said this, I was startled by the scent of sweet shampoo coming from her long hair as she looked into her notebook. At this time, I was already in love with Claire. Once we finished applying to colleges, we would have more free time for each other. I planned to confess my feelings to her then. With this goal in mind, I spent my high school days, but the situation took an unexpected turn. I was chosen for a special scholarship as planned, but I ended up declining it. It turned out that during this time, my father fell sick and could no longer work, and our family's financial situation became dire. I decided that going to college in this situation would be too difficult, so I decided to start working right after high school graduation. I was disappointed that I couldn't go to college, but I decided to move forward and turn the page. However, this situation drastically changed my relationship with Claire. I tried to head to the library with Claire as usual, but something seemed off about her. David, I heard you're giving up going to college and you're going to start working right after high school. Yay, that's actually the case. It's the first time I'm hearing about this. I thought it would worry you, Claire. Um, the college where you had the recommendation slot, my best friend was aiming for that also. Honestly, when I heard that you declined the recommendation, she was also shocked. 
If you were going to decline it, I wish you had given that slot to her from the beginning. I was at a loss for words after hearing this. From Claire's best friend's perspective, my actions must have been inexplicable and probably shocking. Claire, I'm sorry. It's a bit complicated for me too, even though we spent every day together. Before I knew it, Claire's eyes were filled with tears. David, I'm sorry, but I think I'll keep my distance from you from now on. With that, Claire started running in the opposite direction of the library. I wanted to chase after Claire, but in the end, all I could do was stand there. Regardless of the reason, I had deeply hurt her with this incident. So we ended up drifting apart after graduating from high school without resolving anything. I still feel guilty for what I did to her. Just as I was reflecting on my past love like this, something unexpected happened. Later, I ended up promptly getting a housekeeper. When the doorbell rang, I opened the door and was taken aback. Waiting for you. Wait, what? There she was, unmistakably Claire. She had grown into a stunningly beautiful, fair-skinned woman. She too, with a surprised expression, opened her mouth. No way. David is my client today. Shocked. We were both frozen in place for a while, but we couldn't stay like this forever. I invited Claire into the living room, handed her some tea, and Claire said thank you and began to speak slowly. Even though we ended things on such a note, I'm truly sorry for that time. I heard about the real reason why you gave up going to college from other friends. Claire said this with a genuinely apologetic expression. I was surprised by this turn of events as I thought she must have hated me by now. No, it's okay. Looking back, I realize I should have explained the reason more clearly. I said, Huh, but you were just trying to keep me from worrying. Right, David. I truly regret having hurt you like that. Claire replied, looking directly at me. Claire had grown even more beautiful than before and I couldn't help but feel a bit flustered. Trying not to show my feelings, I looked away and said, Let's let bygones be bygones. Anyway, thanks for coming today. Thank you, David. I appreciate you saying that. In order to apologize for what I did, I want to help with whatever you need. As she said this, Claire donned a tidy white apron with neat frills and efficiently began to clean. Being a man, there were some bucks that shouldn't be seen, but it was a good thing that I had tidied them up beforehand. Thanks to her, my messy room was transformed into a clean space in just a day. But I couldn't help wondering, why was Claire working for a cleaning service? I'm sure she had gone to college, but I don't know anything about what happened afterward. Still, I couldn't ask her about every detail of that. After Claire finished cleaning, she cooked dinner for me as part of her service. As I watched her cook skillfully in the kitchen, I found myself wondering if she normally cooked for someone else in this manner. She served a freshly cut, hot gratin. It was so delicious that I was moved. Just after I finished eating dinner, I received a phone call from work, so I told Claire, thank you for today, and answered the phone in my room. The call ended up being longer than I expected, and before I knew it, almost two hours had passed. Thinking that Claire must have left by then, I was surprised to find her asleep at the table when I returned to the living room. I gently shook her shoulder and said, Claire, wake up. It's already 11 o'clock. What? It's that late already? Oh no, I have work tomorrow. If I head to the station now, I'll barely catch the last rain. Seeing Claire panic with a pale face, I could tell she was really in a tight spot. Claire, are you okay? You look really tired. Yes, my part-time job is really demanding, and to be honest, I'm maxed out. I'm sorry for overstaying. I am leaving now. As Claire scrambled to grab her back, I quickly grabbed her arm. 
I couldn't let her go home alone in her current state. David, what's wrong? You said earlier, Claire, that you'd do anything to apologize, right? So here's my request. Please stay over tonight. What? In my words, Claire's eyes widened. I want you to cook another delicious breakfast tomorrow, and after that, you can leave. If that's all you're asking, I'm grateful. With that, Claire took a shower and immediately fell asleep in the guest room. She must have been really tired. I returned to my room and ended the long day by falling asleep. The next morning, I woke up to find breakfast ready on the table, along with a note from Claire saying, Thank you for yesterday. I was relieved to see that she had apparently made it to work okay, but to my surprise, Susan showed up at my apartment again that night. As she prepared dinner, she began to tell me something. Thank you so much for yesterday. I was really tired, so it helped a lot. No problem. You do seem pretty busy, though. Well, the truth is I am living in an apartment in a suburb of Denver with my mom. After high school, my parents divorced and things got tough financially. I had to drop out of college two years ago and have been working part-time jobs ever since to get by. I see. That sounds hard. The suburb of Denver isn't exactly bustling. The transportation is not the best either. It must be tough to commute here. Also, my mom isn't in the best health, so I'm trying to help her. That's why I'm studying to get a computer certification. You really are busy. Yes, but I want to repay my mom for everything. With that, Claire smiled gently. Thank you so much for everything. Sorry to have bothered you. Claire, wait. I stopped her as she was about to leave. If you don't mind, why don't you stay at my place when you come into town for work? I'd love it if you could cook for me. My apartment is in a great location with good public transportations. It might take some of the burden off of you. Honestly, I was afraid she'd be put off by my suggestion, but Claire responded with a happy smile. David, thank you so much. Okay, in return, I'll clean and cook for you. From that day forward, I started asking Claire to take care of my housework on a regular basis. I always paid her as agreed, but when she stayed over at my place, Claire cooked extra food for me. She told me that she used to get really tired from the commute alone, but now that she could stay at my place when she had jobs nearby, it had made her life much easier. Having her clean my apartment was also a great help for me. One day, my sister Emily happened to meet Claire and was surprised. Why is such a beautiful woman in your apartment, David? Emily, this person is the housekeeper. Nice to meet you. I'm Claire. Actually, I went to high school with David. Oh, nice to meet you. I'm his sister, Emily. Despite my clumsy brother, I hope we get along well. Emily quickly became friends with Claire. The two of them were chatting happily, and before I knew it, they were cooking together in the kitchen. And when they ate dinner together, they kept calling each other Claire and Emily, and seemed to be having a great time. I never imagined they would become so close. Even after Emily went home, Claire seemed to be in a good mood. Emily is such a mature and cute girl. She was following you around all the time. Wasn't she a bother? Not at all. I'm an only child, so it felt like I had a little sister. It was fun. After that, Emily frequently visited my apartment to cook and sew with Claire. They always seemed to have a great time together. Watching them, I realized how much I cared for Claire. Despite telling myself that it was all in the past, my feelings for her were only growing stronger but I knew that Claire was just being kind to me because of her job. Right now, just being able to be with her makes me happy. I should be content with that. I kept telling myself that, but then an unexpected event happened. David, I have something to tell you. I'm thinking of quitting the housekeeping service soon. 
A. Why, Claire? I was taken aback by Claire's words. You know, my relatives have arranged to have a meeting with a potential suitor. He runs his own business, and it seems I could get a full-time position there if we get married. It would put my mother's mind at ease, and I've realized I can't just wander aimlessly in life. Claire chatted nonchalantly while briskly handling the housework as usual. However, she never made eye contact with me. I felt both shocked and somewhat uneasy at her words. I see. Well, I feel lonely. I responded. Haha, but I'll work my hardest until I leave. With that, Claire forced a smile and left the apartment. Even if they were not in a relationship yet, it might be awkward for her to stay over at a guy's place before the formal meeting. Despite having some of Claire's homemade food available, I didn't have the appetite to eat, spending time in the living room in a daze. The next thing I knew, Emily had come over and was shocked to see me in a taste of abandonment. Hey, what's going on with you? You're just sitting in the dark, staring into space. Well, when I explained about Claire's arranged meeting, Emily was also surprised. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Seeing me crestfallen, Emily spoke up. You know, you should tell Claire how you feel. Huh. It's clear to see. You love Claire, don't you? If you don't express your feelings before she's gone, you'll definitely regret it. Even if you get turned down in the end, confessing your feelings will prevent any lingering regret. After hearing Emily's words, I realized she was right. Back in high school, we had missed each other because we didn't communicate properly. I don't want to end up like that again. I want to convey to her just how important she is to me. I decided to request Claire's housekeeping service again and waited for her to come. When Claire visited the apartment as usual, I stood directly in front of her. Claire, I have something to tell you. Huh, what is it? I've never been this nervous in my life. But if I don't share my feelings now, I will definitely regret it. That was far scarier than getting turned down. Um, I've always loved you, Claire, ever since high school. That hasn't changed even now that we've reconnected. As I confessed, Claire was surprised and looked at me. Honestly, it felt like my face was on fire, but I had to finish. So, if it's what you want, I want you to go to the arranged meeting. But if it's not what you want, I want you to stop. All I want is for you to be happy, Claire. David, as soon as I finished talking, Claire threw her arms around me. I hadn't dreamed that she'd respond this way, and I turned bright red. I don't really want to go to that meeting, either. I love you, David. Claire. I gently stroked her head. Claire, wiping her tears, continued to speak slowly. I was truly happy when you, David, let me stay at your house and were so kind to me. But I wondered if it was okay for me to keep relying on your kindness like that. You graduated from high school and became a government administrator. Whereas I've achieved nothing. I thought there must be someone better suited for you, David. And if I keep hanging around you, it would be a burden to you. Never had I imagined Claire felt this way. We both had feelings for each other, but neither of us noticed. But I won't repeat the mistakes we made in high school. That's not true. It's okay if it takes some time. Let's move forward slowly on the path that's best for you, Claire. Your mom would want your happiness more than anything. David, thank you. And like that, we held each other tightly. Feeling Claire's warmth close to me, my love for her surged anew. I didn't want to let her go, ever. And so, we officially started dating. Claire, fulfilling her longtime dream, got her computer certification six months later and started her career as a web designer. We took this opportunity to officially start living together, and Claire's mom moved into a house nearby. Now we can meet whenever we want. 
It's a relief. Currently, the two of us are discussing marriage. Well, to be precise, it's three of us. Emily is having a great time with Claire, looking at wedding catalogs. Wow, this dress is cute too. Oh, but this one might be better. Sounds great, Emily. Make sure you dress up for the occasion. Of course, since it's a special occasion, Claire, you should change outfits at least three times. Like this, the two are enthusiastically planning a wedding. Oh boy. If we incorporate all of Emily's ideas, it might cost us a fortune. But seeing the smiles on the two most important women in my life, I can't help but think it's worth it. How did you like it? Your subscription will be a great motivation for our production. See you in the next video. My name's Keith Johnson, turning 42 this year. I graduated college and immediately started working at a trading company, but I couldn't adjust to it at all. Now, I'm working at a coffee shop run by my uncle. After 12 years of service at the trading company, I lived somewhat of a jobless life. I lost interest in everything, even social interactions became a dread. My lifestyle could be easily described as reclusive. The person who brought me out of this was my uncle. A man so obsessed with coffee that he opened up his own specialty shop. In the beginning, I started helping out in the shop somewhat aimlessly, but I soon found myself increasingly captivated by the allure of coffee. Looking back, I'm convinced that this was my uncle's strategy. I'm naturally timid, not good at interacting with people. I was introverted even shy. It's embarrassing to admit, but I've never had a girlfriend, even at the age of 42. I need to set the record straight, though, there is a reason for this. I was raised in a predominantly female household. My father passed away early due to illness. Living with my mother and two assertive sisters, and on top of that, there are even more assertive twi younger sisters. My place at home was minute, to say the least. Growing up surrounded by strong women, I developed a kind of fear and respect for women. I grew into a man too intimidated to approach women. I'm okay with the regulars at the shop, like the older women, but that's about it. Even the local elementary school girl, Emma, calls me Keith casually, that proves how lucky I am. My uncle's coffee shop attracts coffee lovers who gather almost daily. Many of them are even more knowledgeable than me, so I have a lot to learn. I can't do without a notebook at work. I jot down everything I notice or have been taught, so I don't forget. My uncle calls it secret notebook. While I was checking new coffee beans with my notebook in hand, the doorbell rang with a jingle. Excuse me, hello. Spotting me, he cheerfully greets me, deftly maneuvering his wheelchair closer to the counter. He smoothly transfers from his wheelchair to the stool at the counter, using only his arm strength. As always, he does it with ease. His name is Alex Miller, a regular at the shop and a wheelchair user. When we first met, I didn't know how to act. Should I help him? If so, how should I assist him? All I could do was fret. As I stood there worrying, Alex, just like today, smoothly sat down at the counter and laughed. Don't look at me like I'm performing a circus act. From the day we met, Alex and I became good friends. Alex, a coffee lover who frequents this shop, is a treasure trove of knowledge for me. Eager to learn everything, I listen to Alex share his knowledge. Despite being best friends, Alex is only 28 this year. He is 14 years younger than me. And yet, Alex seems far more mature than me. I feel like he's experienced a much denser life than mine. Despite probably having had difficulties that he couldn't share with anyone, Alex was always cheerful. 
He's the kind of guy who laughs off the fact that I quit my job and stayed home for a few years. Currently, Alex is working as a translator from home and often visits the shop to take a break. He often works at the counter with his laptop until closing time. Many of our regular customers are also fans of Alex. Alex is ridiculously handsome. And he's so polished it's somewhat intimidating. I once went shopping with him for clothes. At that time, the outfit that Alex had chosen for me has now become my go-to for important events, just waiting for its moment to shine. But even someone as flawless as Alex has a weakness. Alex has a twin sister. It seems that he simply can't stand up to her. I've been to Alex's house a few times. I've met his mom, but I've never met his sister. I heard some somewhat scary rumors from our regular customers around the same age at the shop. The most common rumor is that she used to be a punk. I didn't ask Alex directly, but I heard this from our regular customers and the clerk. As someone who's not good at women, assertive women are my worst nightmare. I swore to myself that I would definitely keep my distance. Who would have thought that such a turn of events was waiting for me? That day, after working at the shop until closing time, I drove Alex home. His home is on the way, so it is no big deal to drive him home. I ran into Alex's mother, Marianne, who had just come back from her part-time job at the entrance. It had been a while since I saw her last, and Mary Ann has a strikingly beautiful face. As we were making small talk, Mary Ann suddenly clapped her hands together as if she had an idea. Then she said to me, Keith, would you like to go on a blind date? I was flabbergasted at the sudden proposal of a blind date. But Mary Ann, with a grin on her face, moved the conversation forward. Basically, she was suggesting that I go on a blind date with the rumored sister. The ex-delinquent almost slipped out of my mouth, but I managed to hold it back. Alex said, that's a great idea. Surrounded by the parent and child, I felt cornered with no way out. She's a bit older, but I think a gentle guy like you would be perfect for Evelyn. That was the first time I learned her name. Apparently, she's currently living alone and working as an office worker at a printing company in the neighboring town, Nebraska. The fact that she hasn't been around since she started working only fuels the ex-troublemaker theory. But I don't know anything about her, and shouldn't her thoughts on this matter too? Marianne smiled at my flistered response. Everyone's a stranger on a blind date, it'll be fine. I had no rebuttal to her completely reasonable opinion. In the end, they kind of pressured me into agreeing to just meet her. Sooner is better and the date and location were decided on the spot. Marianne was quick to set everything up before I could change my mind. The following Sunday, a somewhat fancy cafe in the middle of a park. That's where I was going to blind date Alex's sister. The weather was incredibly nice and the park was filled with families. When I told my uncle that it was a blind date, he let me have the day off without a second thought. Alex would be there too, figuring I'd be nervous at first. I wore the outfit Alex had chosen for me and waited for them to arrive. Keith, sorry to keep you waiting, Alex's voice called out. I turned around to see Alex in his wheelchair, smiling. Standing behind him was a woman who looked just like him, a real beauty. Upon seeing her, I was momentarily lost for words. I thought, I've never seen such a beautiful woman before. She had the same face as Alex, whom I was so used to seeing, but she was incredibly beautiful. And she looked very grumpy. Probably forced to come here by Alex. Her face seemed to be saying, I'm not happy about this. Oh, this is my sister, Evelyn. She's a 28-year-old office worker. Evelyn gives a small nod in response. I nod my head and mumble, nice to meet you. 
I was already nervous about this blind date. Beside I saw such a beauty, I couldn't find the words to say. Are you both nervous? Alex teases. Without missing a beat, of Lynn's hand slaps the back of Alex's head. She's quick. There might be some truth to the rumor that she used to be a bit of a wild one. Don't tease people like that. Evelyn says in a slightly husky voice. For someone like me, who isn't a fan of the high-pitched voices typical of some girls, Evelyn's voice was perfect. I don't remember much of what happened after that. Alex kept the conversation flowing, and Evelyn and I responded with yes and no. That was our blind date. When Alex left, we sat in silence, and time seemed to stand still. Um, thank you for today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day off too. Evelyn's eyes meet mine as I begin to stutter. Feeling as though I'm being stared by her, my words trailed off. No, I should apologize. Alex and the others pushed you into this. Evelyn says, bowing her head. She seemed far removed from her wild past, which left me speechless. As I sat in stunned silence, Evelyn stood up, quickly grabbed the check, and said, well then, before leaving. Her brisk movements didn't give me a chance to stop her, leaving me stunned. I didn't expect to be left alone. And she even paid the bill. At least the blind date mission was accomplished. I gazed at the park, thinking that as long as we had met, Alex and the others would be satisfied. The next day, when Alex came into the shop, he asked me about what happened after he left, but there was no progress and nothing to talk about. Evelyn left before me. I said, trying not to look at Alex, he then handed me his phone. What? Call Evelyn and set up the next date. I pushed Alex's phone back, repeating, I can't do that. She seemed so unhappy, and I was sure she didn't want to see me again. I'd let her pay for the coffee even though she's 14 years younger, and I figured she must be annoyed. As we shoved phones back and forth across the counter, the doorbell rang, announcing a customer. Welcome. As a reflex, I greeted the customer with a smile and saw Evelyn with a sour look on her face. I froze for a moment. I nodded to Evelyn and moved over to Alex. What, Evelyn, are you off work today? Alex, surprised to see her out and about on a weekday. I took a day off, you see, there was a solo exhibition for Professor, but more importantly, you shouldn't be going out dressed so lightly. Evelyn responded, placing a blanket on Alex's knee. In her hand, she held a small silver oil heater. She probably brought it because she was concerned about Alex, who tends to feel unwell when it gets cold. Oh, the wood carving exhibition, right. It's next week, isn't it? Apparently, she had come to help set up the wood carving exhibition that starts next week at the community center. Evelyn. A graduate of a fine arts college, seems to have majored in wood carving. It's difficult to make a living solely from it, so she's now selling small wooden carvings as a side job. I have some of my works there too, you should check them out. Evelyn said with a light smile. Her whole demeanor changes when she smiles. She has a beauty that seems somewhat irritable when she's not smiling but when she smiles, she looks cute. It's a softer image than I had of her during our blind date, and it's quite a pleasant surprise. Maybe this is where I need to muster up my courage. I plucked at the courage to speak to Evelyn. Um, thank you for the other day, Evelyn. Upon hearing my sudden address, Evelyn seemed taken aback and her shoulders shivered. Without looking at me, she answered in a small voice, you're welcome. For some reason, I didn't feel like she disliked me. I might be conceited, but she seemed shy. Would you like to go out sometime? I blurted out the words before I even realized it. It seems like my desire to know more about her got the better of me. Eh, 
Seeing her surprised look, I pressed on. Eventually, after my plea to go out on another date, Evelyn gave in. This was the first time I had ever pleaded so earnestly with someone. Of course, this was all thanks to Alex's support. I don't think I could have invited her out on my own. Our date was set for three days later. The meeting time was in the evening after work. I waited for her in front of a bookstore, our designated meeting place. She arrived right on time. It wasn't as tense as the blind date, but I was feeling jittery and couldn't calm down. Well, it was my first date, and I was nervous, so she probably felt the same way. I bucked a Vietnamese restaurant, keeping in mind her preferences. This was also thanks to Alex's advice. Even after we arrived and settled at the restaurant, she seemed a bit jittery. She seemed disinterested in what I was saying, and I started to feel sad. The conversation wasn't flowing, and she wasn't eating much. Despite ordering a course filled with her favorite dishes, she seemed to find dining with me very unpleasant. She must have agreed to this date reluctantly because of Alex. As I thought about this, I started to feel more and more downcast. I had mustered up all my courage but it felt like I had swung at thin air. I'm sorry, I think I forced you into having this meal with me. As I put down my chopsticks and said this, Evelyn, who seemed surprised, looked at me. It might be the first time today that our eyes met squarely. I'm sorry too, I wasn't really paying attention. She quickly apologized. Being considered by someone younger made me feel pathetic. It must have shown on my face. She looked at me with a truly apologetic face. I promise I won't invite you out again, so please relax. Managing a smile, I relayed this to her. In response, she placed her hands together and bowed her head in front of me. I'm really sorry. I'm so distracted thinking about Alex's date. Evelyn, with her hands together and bowing as if praying to me, apologized again and again. Tonight, it seemed Alex was also going on a date with a girl. And apparently, it would be their first time going out just two of them. Alex was undoubtedly popular. But, he never had a girlfriend. He told me once that he didn't want to bother the person he liked because he often had to be mindful on dates, that's why he didn't have a girlfriend. So, this was Alex's first date. I could understand why my sister, Evelyn, was on edge. I mean, there are many obstacles, like restrooms, steps, and stuff, right? I'm just worried if Alex might mess up in front of the girl he likes. Considering this, I made a suggestion to Evelyn. Well then, let's go and secretly watch over Alex's date. Evelyn looked puzzled at my suggestion and exclaimed, huh? She probably never imagined that I would suggest such a thing. I quickly stood up with the bill in my hand. You know where they're having their date, right? Evelyn nodded affirmatively and took my hand. I had heard that she did wood carving, and her palm full of calluses proved that she was serious about it. I was somewhat pleased to discover this new side of her. The place where Alex and his date were was close to the restaurant where we were dining. It was an Italian restaurant, well equipped with accessibility features. I went there with Alex a few times. Peering through the large window, I could see Alex and her. People passing by gave us suspicious looks as we hid across the busy street, secretly watching them. From what we could see, there didn't seem to be any problems. He was with a cute girl, reminiscent of cotton candy. They looked like a perfect couple. I thought Evelyn's concerns were unfounded. But, as she continued to intently watch the two of them, Evelyn's expression was dead serious. At that moment, I wondered if this might be the reason for the rumors about her past as a delinquent. Hey, can I ask you something? What? I'm a bit busy right now, she replied still focused on watching Alex. 
Watching over Alex and his company, Evelyn was indifferent to my questioning. Is the rumor about you being a former delinquent true? What? Are you crazy? You just ask this to me. Taken aback by my question, Evelyn unintentionally stood up and shouted. Realizing that she would be noticed by Alex and his date if she wasn't quiet, she quickly crouched down and glared at me. I don't fully understand what delinquent means, but I am not one, she said. So, I asked her why such a rumor had spread. She puckered her lips in irritation. The reason of it all was a fight with a classmate. Back in high school, there was a girl who often bothered Alex. One day during gym class, that girl purposely blocked Alex's wheelchair with her belongings. Unable to exit the classroom, Alex attempted to get past the items but ended up toppling over with his wheelchair. When Evelyn found Alex in the state, she was livid and attacked the girl. She dragged the girl through the hallway to Alex and forced her to apologize. The girl cried loudly, refusing to acknowledge what she did. Evelyn, who dragged the girl around while she was crying out loud, later became a feared entity. That's said to be where the rumors of her being a former delinquent started. She admits that she may have gone too far, but she smiled and said she had no regrets. She probably thought that girl was trying to get Alex's attention. Evelyn said she also came to that conclusion as an adult, but she couldn't forgive it. So, the supposed ex-delinquent sister was just a sister who loved her little brother. The misunderstanding somehow made me chuckle. As I was laughing quietly, Evelyn smacked my back. Evelyn, would you seriously consider dating me? I know I'm like an old man to you, but what do you think? Her eyes widened in surprise at my confession while I was crouching hidden behind the shrubs. No good. I gave it another push, and Evelyn stood up, brushing off the fallen leaves on her knee. She started walking, so I hurriedly followed her. As we walked shoulder to shoulder, Evelyn looked up at me from the corner of her eye. Then she said, show me that thing of yours. Excuse me, here, now. You showed it to Alex, but not to me. With a harsh whisper, I gulped. Show me that, your notebook. By that, Evelyn meant my notebook where I jot down what I study about coffee. I have showed it to Alex once. Apparently, Evelyn heard about it from Alex. I wonder why she wants to see such a thing. While puzzled, I pulled the notebook out of my bag and handed it to Evelyn. Taking the notebook, Evelyn sat on the edge of a flower bed and started flipping through it. After about five minutes, she looked up from my notebook and smiled. You passed. What? What passed? As Evelyn returned my notebook to me with a smile. I was clueless. Looking at this notebook, I can see what kind of person you are, Kita. I can tell you're very sincere and serious. Is this what they call hot and cold? Suddenly, my heart started pounding. So I'm sure there are many things I don't know, but please take good care of me. Evelyn said, bowing her head to me. The sudden turn of events left my mind reeling. Does this mean you've agreed to be my girlfriend? I couldn't help but confirm, and instantly, I felt an impact on the back of my head. It seems she still had the habit of hitting first. That day, we talked about our dreams for the future. I have a dream of becoming a barista. Evelyn had a dream of becoming a wood carving sculptor. When it comes to talking about our dreams, we both get excited. Evelyn suggested making a competition out of who can realize their dream first. I agreed. It was a moment that I convinced myself to become a barista seriously. There exists something called barista study abroad. It's a study abroad where you intern at overseas cafes and gain professional knowledge as a barista. Half a year after starting to date Evelyn, I was in Italy. Even before me, she quit her job and started working as a wood carving sculptor in earnest. 
I couldn't stand the idea of being left behind, so I decided to study abroad. Knowing that if I go abroad, we'd end up in a long-distance relationship, I expected her to stop me, but Evelyn kicked me out the door with a push on my back. I wanted her to say she would miss me a little, but her apparent relief was just like her. Yet, being cheerfully sent off made me feel like I was being brushed aside. She hardly ever reached out. After my internship ended, I kept dragging my return home and started avoiding meeting her again. I kept thinking, what if she's disappointed in me, or maybe she's not contacting because she found someone else. For half a year, another half a year, I ended up spending two years in Italy. I had also earned a few barista qualifications that are recognized in Japan. I can return home now, but I couldn't make up my mind. Plus, I was a little sad to leave Italy. I had been working part-time at the same long-established store where I did my internship. The chime of the doorbell rang out in the empty cafe, signaling the arrival of a customer. As I lifted my face from the coffee I was brewing, I saw an unbelievable face. It was Evelyn, who was supposed to be in Japan. She had become even more beautiful over the two years. With a glare fixed on me, she sat down across the counter, right in front of my eyes. You've kept me waiting too long. Still glaring at me, as she thrust a flyer in front of my eyes. The flyer was for Evelyn's solo exhibition in New York. I realized in an instant that Evelyn had achieved her dream. I'll treat you to a cup of coffee. I say calmly, suppressing my joy, and start working with my hands. Evelyn seemed a little displeased that I wasn't flustered as before. Well, you'd expect some changes after spending two years in Italy. Smooth interaction is also necessary for a barista. Evelyn waited for her coffee with a pout on her beautiful face. I thought it ruined a good-looking face. I placed a latte with latte art in front of Evelyn. Upon seeing the latte art, Evelyn muttered, damn it. I almost laughed at her adorable frustration. But I was nervous too. The latte art on the latte I handed over read, will you marry me? And Evelyn stirred it violently with her spoon, pretending not to see. She drank the latte in one gulp, with a look of indifference on her face. I'll have to treat me to another 100 cups to make up for the weight. I'll write it as many times as it takes until you're satisfied, I replied. Evelyn seemed pleased with my words and nodded. Then she whispered, don't forget what you just said. I got Evelyn's consent to our marriage three days later. When I murmured, you fell pretty easily, didn't you? She hit the back of my head with a surprising force. I guess she remained aggressive for the rest of her life. 